I wanted to find a bank with a purpose. I wanted to find a place that would take my money and not use it to cause the financial crisis, but to fix the financial crisis and to help end income inequality. The people that we employ are usually clients right off the street. They don't have an account, but Amalgamated is willing to get that started for them. Their reputation of supporting the working man, I think, speaks for itself. This is a bank that cares for their customers, and I appreciate that. We were able to access a construction loan through the bank's programs, and that loan has helped us house 28 families in the community. Amalgamated is a bank that was started for and about working people. Many of our customers have a deep commitment to advocating for social and economic justice. We share that commitment, and we're not afraid to stand up and say that we need to change some of the way that the country does business. Giving you everything you need to fight the Trump administration. This is The Bill Press Show, live at youtube.com slash The Bill Press Show. Well, hello, everybody, and a happy Tuesday, November 20th. November 20th? I like I had in my head that it's like November 6th. And like it's November 20th. November is almost over. Like, my God, time these days... It, I, 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 I know I've, I realize I sound like an old man, like just complaining about it. Don't shake your head. That's, that's an enthusiastic. You're, you agree with me too enthusiastically that I'm an old man. How dare you? Uh, no, I have good news to bear, actually. Go ahead. Um, a week and a half ago when we had Maggie Thompson in from um, like the youth branch of CAP. Yeah, yeah, She yeah. said millennials go up until age 38. So you are a millennial. Okay. All right. Here's the thing. I there are so many different definitions to the word millennial. And I don't know where I fall. No, you're young. You're a millennial. I like I want to hang on to that, but I also don't feel like that's accurate. But How do you identify then? Like what generation? I'm like in one of those weird in-betweens. I there's like there's Gen X. Uh there's Gen Y. I think we're in Gen Z now, the kids that are being born. Are in Gen Z. So I'm like somewhere between X and Y. Because there are people that say like, oh, to be a millennial, you had to be born in the 19, like after 1980. I was born in 1979. So I'm like, I'm like, there's like I'll a weird. you as an honorary millennial. Oh, I feel that's, that's so sweet. Thank you, Ray. Ray Rogers running the board this morning. Oh, hi, by the way, my name is Peter Ogburn, sitting in for Bill Press today. Ray Rogers uh, running the board and helping us man the ship today. Also, McKenna is here, uh, and Monty Kanzler is keeping us on TV, on YouTube, on free speech TV. Uh, don't forget, you can also get our podcast which goes up live after the show. Uh, we have scheduled some very, very good and exciting content for you to consume over the holiday break. We're not going to be here on Thursday and Friday, but our podcast will be. So make sure you are subscribed so that you can get the podcast when we put it up and when it goes up. The other thing to mention is there's another, there's a great podcast up there that we put up over the weekend with Gideon Resnick from uh, The Daily Beast who has written about uh, Bernie Sanders, and now he's taking on Walmart after he successfully took on Amazon. Now he's taking on Walmart and sort of the importance of that. Uh, so go check that out to get the details for all of that. Boy, oh boy, what a big, big show. I'll just set the table a little bit for you before we get up and running. The White House Correspondents Association yesterday announced that they are changing the way that they do the White House Correspondents' Dinner. Uh, now, I have um, a couple of thoughts on that I will share in just a couple of moments, and I'll tell you what the changes are. Also, the White House uh, putting out some guidelines for the media and how they will take questions from the media moving forward. This, of course, stems from Jim Acosta and him having his hard pass taken away, which has now been reinstated. 
Also, Nancy Pelosi continues her quest to become Speaker of the House uh, again. Uh, there were some Democrats who fought back yesterday, signed a letter saying that they cannot support her. We will talk about that and her chances of uh, making it to the speakership yet again. Also, Ivanka Trump is in some hot water. We will explain why uh, the brazenness of the anybody with the last name Trump never ceases to amaze me. But we'll tell you all about that story. Plus, there is a new movie coming out around Christmas time all about Dick Cheney. It's called Vice. Uh, and the director of the movie gave a very interesting interview to Hollywood Reporter yesterday, and I want to talk about that. And that is where we will begin today's show. But first, we need to take a very, very quick break. Let our uh, affiliates join in. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. This is the Bill Press Show. It is the Bill Press Show. Hi, everybody. My name is Peter Ogburn, sitting in for Bill Press today as we continue our way through the Thanksgiving week. Uh, Just as I mentioned yesterday, uh, the Thanksgiving hotline is open. I did get a couple of questions yesterday. I will address them later on in the show. Uh, First of all, I got a couple of questions about brining. I'm an anti-brine person. I'm an anti-brine person. How do you prefer to cook your turkey? I do a dry brine. Uh, you salt it uh, and let it sit overnight so that the skin gets nice and crispy when you cook it. But when you, people who soak it in this uh, saline brine, uh, it's no good for me. The skin won't crisp the same. The skin will not crisp the same. Because it has sucked up all of this extra moisture. So much moisture. Yeah. People say, like, oh, that's the way that you get, like, really tender breast meat in particular. Like, the breast meat tends to dry out on the turkey. I think it's a little mushy, frankly. And I also think that your gravy gets overly salty because you've got this salty bird and all the drippings are too salty. Anyway, look, all I'm saying is find us on Twitter at BP Show, at BP Show. Find me on Twitter at Peter Ogburn, and I will answer all of your Thanksgiving questions. It's just my service I do every year. This is my form of charity. I help you out. (laughs) This is my community service to make myself feel good. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I want to pick up where I started the show yesterday talking about how the Washington football team has a quarterback problem. They lost their their quarterback, and so now uh, they they have to find a new quarterback. Yesterday they found the new quarterback. It was the guy I mentioned yesterday, the guy that did the butt fumble. They hired Mark Sanchez. I don't know much about football, but I feel like that's classic D.C. It is. It actually is. Mark Sanchez used to be a uh, starting quarterback in the NFL. I think he has some name recognition, and that is really what uh, Dan Snyder cares about. Like he, He's the guy that will go throw way too much money to an over-the-hill player that cannot play football anymore, and that's just the way that they do it, okay? That's just how it goes. <laughs> Monty says that's the backup, Peter. No, I know he's the backup, but my point is, you know who else he could have hired as a backup? Colin Kaepernick. Ha, ha, ha. I'm translating for our video <laughs> operator, Monty. I know. I get like I get it, right? Like, they got to have a backup quarterback. There are a lot of options out there. They brought busted asshole, tired Mark Sanchez out of retirement. I thought you a- were going to say, like, Cal Ripken. I'm just kidding. <laughs> and I know that's the wrong sport. I'm joking. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that that's that's all I've got for the football corner, okay? I don't talk a lot of football on the show. I don't even really watch the NFL at all. But it is telling that Colin Kaepernick continues to not be able to get a job in the NFL. Uh, But Mark Sanchez, they brought him back to the game after he left. So it's just, it's pretty remarkable. Also, uh, as I mentioned, it's Thanksgiving week. You're not traveling. You're here for Thanksgiving. Are you going to be traveling? I'm going to be traveling a little bit. Okay. AAA has warned that traffic this year, are you driving or flying? Flying. Okay, so I'm driving this year. Yeah, but I feel like you're going early enough. I am. Well, tri- let me let me say this. AAA has predicted, predicted that 54.3 Americans will travel 50 miles or more 
for Thanksgiving. That is the highest number recorded in more than a dozen years. They also helpfully put out this little list that says this is when traffic is going to be the worst in your particular area. So Houston, weirdly enough, the worst travel day, Monday between 2 p.m. and 4 p.m., Man, Texas, y'all are getting out early. Early start on Thanksgiving. Monday. I mean, respect it. Boston, Tuesday between 4 and 6. Washington, D.C., today, Tuesday, between 5 and 7 p.m. Now, I'm going to get a jump. I'm going to get a jump on on the 5 to 7 p.m. situation. But still, today's going to be a bad traffic day. I wish you many good podcasts and two boys that get along. Well, here's the here's the the key to doing this, right? And now that I've now that we've had a couple of years, we've got a a teenager. uh, The kids do not they don't sit in the back seat together. I sit in the back seat. Yes, I sit in the back seat, and one of them rides up front, and then one of them rides in the back with me. And you know what? Most peaceful drive you'll ever have. Wait, Lucinda drives the whole way herself. Here's the deal. She doesn't ride in the back seat. She can't ride in the back seat. So naturally, she has to drive. And so it's sort of it's it gets to a point of whether or not she wants to drive the whole way or listen to the kids fight in the back seat. And that's just a choice that she has to make. <laughs> She's making the right choice. By I the think way. so, yeah, right? Yeah, like yeah. I like like if I, I mean, and I have no problem driving. I truly don't. Like I used to drive all the time. Yeah, you drive by yourself all the time. All the time. But like when we would drive like for family vacations, I would always drive. Uh but now that they're older and they are just toxic together, we just have to keep them separated, as the offspring once said. Anyway, uh I hope you have a fabulous uh travel situation no matter what you're doing for Thanksgiving. So I I there's so much news to talk about. Uh, you know, Ivanka Trump yesterday it's it's just mind blowing. I, I I can't spend a ton of time on this. I really can't because it'll just be it'll just drive you crazy. So there's a story. Ivanka Trump used her personal email account to send hundreds of emails about government business. Now Ivanka Trump is essentially the first lady. Melania Trump's not doing much other than her be best campaign. And so Ivanka Trump has sort of taken over as 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 first lady. And so she's got her hands in a lot of different governmental affairs. So the fact that she's using her personal email account to share government business is a boneheaded, very stupid thing to do. It is very similar to what Donald Trump beat up on Hillary Clinton about. Lock her up. Lock her up. That was all about the emails. He talked about the emails incessantly. And at the time, I said the same thing. The Hillary emails, not that big a deal. A little boneheaded, I think, if you're running for office. I mean, it, it is technically against the rules, right? If we're getting into this, like, it is technically against the rules. But it's just not that big of a deal. This is not. There are other things that the Trump family has done and continues to do that are bigger national security threats than Ivanka Trump sending a couple hundred emails. Right. Like, it, like, like, I just don't have the bandwidth to get annoyed about that. Like, of course they do. And we already knew that Donald Trump was using an unsecured phone. He yeah. lost it. Like, this, this does not surprise me at all. These and, stories and have come out over and over. Shock. The Trump family might be a little hypocritical, y'all. Breaking news. I want to play the clip from Jeff Tubin because I think Jeff Tubin just, as he has been doing so frequently these days, he just hit the hit the nail right on the head. Not, it's technically not within the rules, but everybody in government does it. This is the problem. I mean, this is why Hillary Clinton got a very raw deal. May not be illegal, but in terms of irony, off the charts. Oh, my God. I mean, you know, it, it, it's just and, and, you know, and I feel personal responsibility for this as well. I spent a lot of time here on CNN talking about Hillary Clinton's emails, and I think we talked about it too much. I think we made a bigger deal of it as, th- than it should have. But 
it, it I mean, it, it fundamentally is not that big a deal. It's not that big a deal for Ivanka, and it shouldn't have been that big a deal for Hillary. That's exactly how I feel about it. That is exactly how I feel about it. The media did too much about Hillary Clinton's emails in 2016. Uh, it, it was a... a for the most part, a non-story, uh, and the Ivanka stuff, as far as I'm concerned, is kind of a non-story. Now, here's where this could be a real problem for the Trump family and Ivanka Trump. The Democrats now have power in the House. They can go after this, and they can hold her accountable because it is a fairly minor rule break. But it is a rule break. And this is what Congress is supposed to do is, is checks and balances. So the Trump family should be very careful about how they do these types of things. Will they? Probably not. Uh, but, you know, to Tubin's point, I want to pick up. We're going to talk some Nancy Pelosi later on in the show. Uh, uh, Nancy Pelosi, again, talk about hitting the nail on the head. She gave an interview yesterday to the New York Times Magazine and this gets back to how the media handled the lock her up, lock her up, Hillary Clinton's emails. It, this is a quote from Nancy Pelosi, and this is the truest thing I've read all day. Quote, may I say something you're not going to like? I think the press loves him. I'm talking about Donald Trump. I think the press loves him all day on TV, and I don't even watch TV except for sports. I love Nancy Pelosi. I only watch TV for sports. But he says somebody had a horse face all day. We hear about that. We hear about Kanye West all day. You just give him all day. So I don't want you to think I'm making an analogy. The descendant of Italian immigrants then laughed, unable to resist. But Mussolini, he didn't care what they said about him as long as they were talking about him. End quote. And that is, that is Donald Trump. All coverage is good coverage. There's no such thing as bad press. That's what's going on. And the media constantly talks about Donald Trump. Look, folks, we're, we're a little guilty of that ourselves. I mean, we're a little bit different in the sense that we have an agenda. We have a partisan slant on things. But when you look at CNN and MSNBC and Fox News, who is they're in a category unto themselves. But, I mean, they're obsessed with Donald Trump. And you have to wonder, why is that? Well, I think he's good for ratings. But I also think that if you're in the news business and you're worried that much about ratings, you might be in the wrong business. Nancy Pelosi is 100% correct. Which is, again, why we spent so much time talking about Hillary Clinton out of damn emails. I feel like the media keeps having these massive fumbles because with Hillary Clinton, it was an opportunity to talk about, as Tubin has um, that this is a systemic problem. And is it right for Hillary to do it? Is it right for Ivanka to do it? Is it right for Trump to do it? No. So why don't we talk about the larger problem? Right. Or like the Acosta thing, right? Sure. Like it's not really about Jim Acosta, right. this one person. It's about a larger orchestrated attack to dismantle free press. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, so that really is all I, I have to say about the Ivanka, uh, uh, e email situation it is curious by the way <laughs> that yesterday talk about perfect timing ivanka sent out this tweet four out of five women behind bars are mothers when you incarcerate a woman you incarcerate her entire family stand with us in calling congress to pass the first step act, step act and help resp restore dignity for incarcerated women okay Sounds like a good plan. Also, might hit a little too close to home for Ivanka Trump. That's all I'm going to say. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, we'll talk about some of the White House press corps stuff as well, because yesterday uh, the White House. So Jim Acosta now has his hard pass back. The White House is not going to take it back from him anytime real soon, it appears. But they did put out a when the white when the, when a court ruled in favor of. Uh, Jim Acosta, they said part of the reason was because the White House had no real set of rules to enforce, therefore he was never, how was he to know, right? So yesterday the White House put out sort of a list of rules. You can ask one question at a time. Follow-up questions are only allowed at the discretion of the president or White House staff. 
give up the mic immediately after asking your question. Failure to follow rules result, results in a revocation of a hard pass. So they have put these very strict rules. I mean, the idea that you're not going to be able to ask a follow-up question to uh, something that you asked is insane. I mean, it's insane. It's laughable, right? Uh, because the Trump administration, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, uh, just revels in her abuse of the press when she uh, has these press briefings, which are less and less frequent these days. But they they can they they can take away hard passes now. That that's sort of the reason that they put these rules together is so they can say, follow these rules or we'll take your hard pass. That way, when you go to court next time after they take Jim Acosta's hard hard pass away, they could say he broke the rules that we very publicly stated. So this is not the end of the saga. But for now, he's back in. The other story dealing with the White House correspondence uh, and <laughs> the White House press team. So the White House Correspondents' Dinner, which Bill goes to every year, I, I've gone to a couple of times. Uh, I haven't gone in the age of Donald Trump and will not go in the age of Donald Trump. Uh, we used to have the bandwidth to sort of enjoy things here in Washington, and I think that's pretty much gone. So last year, Michelle Wolf, a comedian, uh, spoke and said some very disparaging but true things about the Trump administration and Sarah Huckabee Sanders in, in general, or in specifically, I should say. So there was this fallout and clutching of pearls and fainting and, oh, oh, the decorum, the decorum. And because somebody was mean about very mean, lying people. So there's an entertainer every year, and I remember when Stephen Colbert gave his speech at the White House Correspondents' Center about George W. Bush, and it was pretty blistering. And it, it, he sort of mocked the weapons of mass destruction and leading us into war and all of that, and people got so upset and very annoyed. And you know who the performer was the next year? Rich Little. Rich Little, who's a billion years, do you know who Rich Little is? All right, he's a million years old. He used to be like a mimic on TV. He just he, and he had fairly good impressions, but okay. very milk toast, bland. Never said a one controversial joke in his entire life. He was just like he would. He was the guy that would do like Jimmy Stewart impressions. He did a mime series for like the next forty five minutes, right? Like yeah, he right. Just didn't yeah, even a, talk. He no was words. Just like, no words. With his words hand. aren't allowed. Yeah. <laughs> and it was the most boring, bland, milk toast thing you've ever seen. So then that just sort of carried on through the, the Bush administration. So then Barack Obama came along. He had some very good comedians. Some of them were better than others. I remember Wanda Sykes. I saw her. She just destroyed. She did such a good job. Uh, Jimmy Kimmel did okay. Uh, Seth Meyers was okay. Um, uh, Oh, what's the guy's name from The Daily Show? Larry, um, I forgot. Something the with a W. Larry, Larry Wilmore. Larry Wilmore. Wilmore. He, the, the, the problem that they had with the comedians with the Obama years is that Barack Obama had impeccable timing and could tell a joke. And so he, and he had, uh, again, an army of writers to write these great jokes. And he would come out and he would just destroy. I mean, he would kill the room in the best way possible. Obama had an uncanny sense of timing. Yeah. And he really understood how to work audiences. Yeah, 100%. And, like, better than a lot of very well-paid named comedians. I mean, like, Larry Wilmore got blown out of the water when I saw him. And his ability to keep a straight face yeah. while delivering was so good. I mean, he's the president of the United States. Sure. He should be able to keep a good poker face. Sure. But it just adds to the humor and the delivery. So last year we have Michelle Wolf. And uh, she, uh, you know, some people think that they that she went over the line, whatever. Uh, so this year they announced the entertainment. It's not a comedian. <laughs> this is the most Washington, D.C. S. I've ever heard. Ron Chernow, one of the most eminent biographers of American presidents and statement statesmen, will be the featured speaker at the annual dinner. So there will be no comedy. They got a biographer. They got a historian. Come for the lecture, friends. Now, I will say that 
if he gets into the role that the press has played over the years, that could be a valuable thing for the Washington press corps to hear. However, (laughs) it's not what this is about. I mean, talk about just bootlicking to the Trump administration, right? Like, Heaven forbid you do something even remotely, slightly controversial. I hope that Ron Chernow gets up there and just tells, like, you know, dick jokes for the whole time. Like, he should just go and just tell, like, horrible, awful, offensive jokes. Now, wouldn't that be funny? Anyway, I think that's a big swing and a miss, if you ask me. Also, I teased at the beginning of the show a fascinating interview in The Hollywood Reporter Uh, with uh, actor Christian Bale and director Adam McKay. Now, uh, Adam McKay has directed this new movie called Vice, and Christian Bale put on about 50 pounds to play Dick Cheney. Have you seen this trailer? I haven't seen it yet. I have it bookmarked, but I did see a still of it, and he looks pretty good, actually. He looks amazing. He looks remarkably similar. So he put on about 50 pounds. There's a piece in the interview where they were saying that they got you know, he's Christian Bale is a method actor, right? Like he lost a ton of weight for um, uh, the the Machinist, a movie he did. Like he got just like down to skin and bone for that movie, and then for this one, he bulked up and put on a ton of weight. And they said that one of the things is like all of a sudden they saw this receipt for a weird neck exercise machine, and he was like, "I I think I could get my neck just like Cheney's." And if you look at a picture of him, like he nailed it. He built up his neck muscles to look like Dick Cheney. That's how much commitment he did to this. But, you know, Christian Bale doesn't get into the politics at all. Adam McKay uh, does. And he says something that I've actually been saying for a long time, for the last year, I should say. Uh, When you look at Donald Trump and you put him through the lens of history in terms of the presidents that we have had in the past, Donald Trump is not the worst president that we've had ever. Like, if you were to – people are talking about, like, oh, I miss the days of George W. Bush. Even Democrats. I have Democrats say, oh, I miss the days of George W. Bush. Wasn't that nice when we had George W. Bush? No. I would take Donald Trump over George W. Bush in a heartbeat. In a heartbeat. This needs some explanation. George W. Bush killed a million people. He lied us into war that killed literally a million people. And he's a war criminal. He's a war criminal. The open graft and corruption that existed within the Bush administration honestly pales in comparison to what the Trump administration is doing. And he did it with a smile. And he did it with a smile. And poorly worded And very folksy. And as you said, yes, very poorly worded statements. Dick Cheney was essentially running the government. Dick Cheney and the corruption that he oversaw when he was essentially running a shadow government for eight years of George W. Bush did more damage to this country than Donald Trump has ever come close to even approaching. Now, I understand that Donald Trump is rude and he offends our sense of uh, of decorum and all of that. But we're talking about a million deaths that George W. Bush caused. And you're just not going to have that scale of incompetence with the Donald Trump administration. I, you know, I, I've said before, the weird thing is the, 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 the graft and corruption that we see within the Trump White House, and we do see a lot, are relatively small. Like, it's bad. And don't get me wrong, this is not a pass or an excuse for what he's doing. But you are the most power, one of the most powerful people in the world, and you're worried about like rebranding the water bottles with your name at the White House. Like, that's the, st- and there's other stuff going on. I'm not trying to, to downplay to minimize, it. Sure. But like, what Dick Cheney did, the like, the outsourcing of government security, the outsourcing of uh, like sending all the like Blackwater, all the stuff that we sent over to the Middle East, the complete destabilization of an entire region of the world, that all came from George W. Bush. I want to be very clear. I am not saying that Donald Trump is a good guy, but when we talk about when you see George Bush being hokey and jokey with Michelle Obama and passing her a mint when they're together, <laughs> like that guy should be in jail. Absolutely. And 
I think that Donald Trump is causing a lot of harm and dividing the country in a lot of ways. Sure. And I am also not minimizing his actions because the things that he is doing, undermining our democracy, who knows, potentially working with the Russians to hand elections, these are the seeds that are being planted that could easily, easily lead to another million deaths yeah. here on sure. American soil. Right, right. It could. It very well could. It very well could. And that's a fair point. But, my, but, but like, this should not be— like, But p- it can't— Bush cannot be minimized. No, not at all. I mean, George Bush was the worst president that we have ever had. He was the worst president that we have ever, ever had. And look, as you said, the groundwork has been laid for some very scary stuff coming from the Trump administration. And I think that that's fair. However, Donald Trump, I think, is just far too incompetent to actually carry out large scale murder, torture, destabilization and disruption that George W. Bush and Dick Cheney did. There were people out there that acted like this was some sort of a controversial statement yesterday. There were people that were freaking out and saying, like, I can't believe, like, yeah, Donald Trump makes us mad, and he should. But to the idea that this is a controversial statement that George W. Bush was far scarier than Donald Trump could ever be, that's not controversial to me. Donald Trump is sort of hampered by a lot of incompetence and also the fact that he's just kind of in, like, not kind of, he's mentally unwell. He's not going to be able to carry out the stuff that the George W. Bush administration. George W. Bush administration was a professional, effective machine. I think that in a lot of ways, though, and I'm curious to have your thoughts on this, George W. Bush was also an incompetent bumbling fool but he had people within the administration that were pulling the marionette strings and i don't think that that it's wrong to draw that parallel with the trump administration i also think that trump is extremely mentally unfit to be the president and probably does not have a grasp on things enough to really orchestrate the kind of madness and chaos that somebody like cheney did but he can easily fill his cabinet with people that can i I think I think that Donald Trump is mentally unwell and unfit to be president. George W. Bush was unqualified, but he surrounded himself with people who were qualified, just also had nefarious plans that they enacted on a daily basis. I mean, we joked all the time when we were doing the show during the Bush administration that Dick Cheney was actually running the government. And the farther we get away from the Bush presidency, the more that looks like it was 100% true. Dick Cheney was the real president. And Dick Cheney, the corruption that he oversaw and the just bilking of the, like like when I talk about Donald Trump and the bilking of, of Americans, it's it's true. It's happening. We're seeing it. And it's usually to just to benefit him, right? But what Dick Cheney did billions and billions of billions of dollars to defense contractors. I mean, we're going to take a long time to recover from that. We are still recovering from that. We are still at war in Afghanistan and Iraq. I mean, that's still going on, y'all. I mean, we're still under the bad moves that the Bush presidency did. So, Again, I'm not trying to soften the image of Donald Trump and say that he's some great guy. I'm just saying, when we talk about Donald Trump as a bad president, he doesn't even come close to George W. Bush. And by the way, the other thing that Adam McKay said is, let's not be so glowing about Bill Clinton either. I'm not necessarily willing to say that Bill Clinton was a worse president than Donald Trump. But you look at what Bill Clinton did. He completely destabilized and deregulized the banks. That's, that began with Bill Clinton. A lot of people gave George W. Bush a lot of grief for it, and he deserves it. That began under Bill Clinton. You look at how unions crumbled in the 1990s. Thank you, Bill Clinton. You look at what happened with NAFTA and the exporting of jobs here in America. Thank you, Bill Clinton. You look at the Me Too movement and where we are now and how Bill Clinton essentially just got a pass on all of that. Thank you, Bill Clinton. But that one also precedes Bill Clinton. That would precede, (laughs) to be fair, that precedes Bill Clinton. But he got away with it. He got away with some very terrible behavior that we just excused. So, uh, look, 
I don't want to be accused of softening the image of Donald Trump. That is absolutely, positively not what I'm doing. I'm just saying you can run a much more effectively corrupt and dangerous government than the one that we have right now. And that, again, should not be a very controversial statement. All right, everybody, we're going to take a very, very quick break. We will be right back. We're going to talk about something. That we talked a little bit last week, and I want to get into sort of what it could mean. That is Amazon HQ2. Amazon uh, has selected their two new uh, headquarters. We'll be talking to senior economist at the Center for American Progress, Benga Adjilore, coming up next. Stay tuned. Follow us on Twitter at BP Show. This is The Bill Press Show. There was an old woman who lived in a shoe. She had so many children, she didn't know what to do. Did you have a good day at school? She gave them some broth without any bread. There you go. And kissed them all soundly. Night night. Good night. And put them to bed. Hunger is a story we can end. End it at feedingamerica.org. Awkward. Do I look familiar? I should. You might remember me from here. Here. We we remember. Or maybe even here. But an awkward silence can be a great thing. It can actually be a perfect moment to reach out to a friend and ask if they're okay if they seem down. It doesn't matter how you say it. You all right? Everything's okay? All G. You all right, girl? Oh, you cool? You bug and dog. Just show you're there for them. Go on, Kelly. Seize the awkward. Hey, um, you haven't really been yourself lately. Are you okay? Find out how you can help a friend with their mental health at SeizeTheAwkward.org. Do you want to retire like a champ? Just like legendary basketball star Uncle Drew? Don't do it like that, Uncle Drew! You're already acing the game. You've got your dream ride. Don't be slamming my door. Sorry about that. You just did this now. Gotta get the boys. Your dream vacation and your dream team. And now you can make your retirement just as legendary. I get buckets. Get the tips you need to get on track at aceyourretirement.org. It's a big responsibility. Oh, it's huge. I know, it's huge. And the salary? Oh, my God, yes. I mean, like, I was literally, I was about to move in with my parents, and (laughs) right before, yeah, so it saved me. I, I really believe in you, you know? Thank you. It's nice to hear that from someone. <laughs> These are cool. Did you, um, did you? Download our podcast. Search for The Bill Press Show on iTunes. And remember to rate, review, and subscribe. This is The Bill Press Show. It is The Bill Press Show. Yes, remember to subscribe to our podcast. Just look for it in iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, we'll have today's show out right after the program. Uh, but also, we are not going to be here on Thursday and Friday because we're going to be celebrating Thanksgiving. But we will have podcasts out on both Thursday and Friday. We recorded some stuff to put out just for you. Uh, so when you're cooking Thanksgiving uh, dinner or whatever you're doing, just just put us on. Have us on in the, in the background. You can hear what we're talking about. Uh, so we got some special programming for you uh, over the holidays. Uh, thank you very much for your comments on Twitter. We are tweeting at BP Show, at BP Show. I am also tweeting 
at Peter Ogburn. Uh, <laughs> the show tweeted, we have Peter Ogburn in the big chair this morning. You don't want to miss it. Thank you to Tiborticus, who just says, I think I'll pass. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, I appreciate Vortex. it. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. To pick up on what I was saying about um, Donald Trump versus George W. Bush, we got a couple of comments. Phil says one word: Blackwater. Yes, absolutely. You look at you look at the Blackwater stuff. Uh, that's completely insane. Holly says uh, Trump with the GOP help is setting us up as a dictatorship. Yes, I agree with that. And Tom says the Trump family are the royals with no clothes. Thank you very much for your comments. You can find us on Twitter at BP Show, at BP Show, or find me at Peter Ogburn. Uh, the other thing, of course, that Donald Trump has, which I was just discussing with my next guest, senior economist, a- a- economist at the Center for American Progress, Bega Agilore. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. The other thing uh, worth talking about is just the open racism and the excusing of racism that we get in Donald Trump's White House, which is, yes, worse than what George W. Bush did. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so you're the senior economist at the Center for American Progress. I brought you in because I wanted to talk to you about an issue that we've been talking about a lot. And this is something that I am very conflicted about because I'm as I'm an Amazon prime member. I think the service is great. All that being said, I also recognize that Amazon is not good. In fact, they are bad. They are, I think, a force for bad when it comes to working Americans. And so, you know, this HQ2 situation of uh, dividing this these the second headquarters up between a couple different cities, <clears throat> you wrote about all of the different incentives that these cities were throwing at Amazon to try and get them to, to come, come there. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, this is something that's uh, almost bigger than Amazon. Because a lot of times you have these large companies, and with these large companies, they bring a huge tax base, they bring people, and they bring a lot of, even just um, your city that gets that uh, co- company. It's almost like the Olympics, where all these cities are trying to get the Olympics. And so what ends up happening, because there's so few of these large-scale events, large-scale companies, that cities throw the farm at them. Yeah. And so you have all types of incentives, like, you know, a break on property taxes, um, a break on income. And so you have all these cities that are trying to compete for them, and then Amazon ends up picking up New York and Washington, D.C. You know, we we have talked for years. Uh, I'll give credit to Travis Waldron from the Huffington Post, who used to be at uh, Think Progress, and he has written about how these cities bankrupt themselves from trying to get the Olympics, Mm -hmm. and they put themselves into utter ruin, and you cannot come back from it. Right. And... I, I, f- I think you're right. I fear that we're sort of getting to this situation with, with these big corporations. Uh, Amazon has promised, I'm just reading from, from your piece that you wrote for Market Watch, um, the promised infusion of $5 billion worth of investments, the creation of more than 50,000 jobs and scores of new high-income residents across the two regions in Arlington County, Virginia, and Queens, New York. This has been going on for a year. Uh what are the kind of tax breaks are is Amazon going to get from all of this? Because again, they sort of threw the, I mean, they threw everything at Amazon to try and get them to come to these locations. Well, what's interesting about New York and Washington D.C. is that if you compare the ones that are available, uh, the other cities like Chicago, um, actually D.C. also competed, Montgomery County, um, Newark, all these cities, New York and the Arlington County area are not the har- largest incentives. Mm. And it actually wasn't the large, the, they didn't, Amazon did not choose the l- cities with the largest incentives. Sure, sure, sure. They actually chose New York and DC. And what this brings up is then this kind of question is, wh- did these other cities actually have a chance? Mm. Did they actually were able to compete? And so there's been a big debate and discussion about that where it was like Amazon probably just wanted to go to New York City and DC but then what they end up getting with all these cities, they got all this information about their finances and government and things like that. And people are wondering, is that going to be used in terms of their corporation? I would bet yes. If I right. had to bet, I would bet yes. But, you know, I, my uh, reaction when I heard this news is they probably knew they were going to do this all along. Right. They just kind of wanted to either get the information, right, like you, as you mentioned, or just sort of – see 
what they could get for it, you know. But you mentioned that they, that that they did not go with the cities that offered them the highest incentives. Right. Um, so what do they get from New York and and the Washington D.C. area, Arlington County? Uh, probably the largest uh, aspect that they get would be the property tax relief, and so and a lot of kind of um, uh, money in in terms of incentives, um, investment tax break credits, um, in terms of bringing uh, firms in. And so this is one of the kind of uh, general. So some uh, Tim Bartek at the Upjohn Institute does a lot of work on looking at incentives that cities offer. Um, one of the big ones that came up is uh, Foxconn in Wisconsin. Yes. And that's one where that people have actually calculated that they spent almost like probably 50000 even more per job to bring Foxconn in. And a lot of the argument about bringing Foxconn in was that, okay, we're going to bring a lot of uh, jobs to the Wisconsin area, the Racine area. But then what they found is that when Foxconn came in, the kind of work that they're doing, they're actually going to be importing employees from other cities and other yeah. countries. And so you look at something like that, and that's just, <laughs> it, you, you just kind of wonder about that. And, you know, why would, why would we allow that? Why would we allow that? Because there's this kind of general thought that we need to bring the big firm in, and that's going to revitalize our area. When in a lot of cases, these companies all started small. And the key is how do you foster small businesses? How do you foster local entrepreneurs? And so in that uh, market watch, much piece, we're talking about Opportunity Zone and the Opportunity Zone Incentive yeah. Program. And part of the argument for that is that you bring in all of this cap, all these capital gains, uh, realized capital gains, and then you invest in these local areas. So not just in terms of housing, but also in terms of businesses, helping people get startup and startup capital. However, because of the way the program is structured, there is no guarantee that this is going to happen. And so you, what's going to happen is that you just have all these capital gains going to this area People are just going to gentrify with displacement, um, putting money in, and there's no kind of concern about the local residents. That's actually that was actually my next question. So you led right into it. Uh, the residents that already are there in uh, Queens and uh, just outside of Washington D.C. in Arlington County, uh, what sort of impact will they feel? Because you hear a lot of positive stuff, right? Housing prices should go up if you already live there, right? Right. So that's that's great if you own a house there, great, great, good for you. Uh, but what else does it do uh, to the residents that are already there? Well, th one of the biggest concerns is that the residents that are already there in two, three years are no longer going to be there because if you're renting, then rent prices are going to go up, yeah. and then you end up getting pushed out. Sure. And one of the other concerns about both the Arlington <clears throat> County and New York uh, Queens area is that the places that were designated opportunity zones some of them don't really count. So in order to be designated as opportunity zone, you either have to have a poverty rate above 20% or a median family income, 80% of the area. But there's a couple census tracts there that were contiguous to uh, lo low-income areas, mm -hmm. and they were designated. So you have one in Queens where they have a median household income of $138,000. But that's an opportunity zone census tract, a quote-unquote distressed community. You know, there's one in Arlington County that's 90000 Yeah. And so the question is, okay, so now you have these places that are already doing well, people who live there, Amazon comes in, money's coming in, there's going to be all kind of just re real estate development, and that's going to increase the ho home values, and then people are going to get priced out. So the housing market in both of these areas are about to just go completely cuckoo bananas, right? Like it's well, in certain gonna... cases, some of them are, already have. Sure. Okay, fair point. <laughs> so there's an Urban Institute study where they actually looked at 4% of the census tracts that were designated okay. already gentrified. Not at risk of gentrified, but have already gentrified. And But there's more money that's going to be coming in. And that's one of the other concerns is that because there's no guardrails in terms of where money should go, how it should be invested, you could have there's you know over eight thousand census tracts that are designated opportunity zones, mm. but all the money are going to go to the places that are going to bring back the biggest returns. Oh man, that's and I mean, to, to, and I, know, oh. I, I can see your face, but there was this uh, article by one of these uh, hedge funds that are talking about the top ten opportunity zones. Yeah, you know, top five were in California, so L.A., San Francisco, San Jose, San Diego. Then there was uh, Seattle. Mm -hmm. Then there was New York. Which Amazon has already taken over. Like, right. I, I love, my favorite thing after the Amazon news were all the tweets from people that live in Seattle, yeah. and they mm -hmm. were like, guess what? Right. 
<laughs> this is not as good as you think it is. Right. Like we've seen this play out here at home. What what has Seattle seen play out? Like with the with Amazon being there. Well, the biggest thing is that they've seen a huge increase in their homeless population, mm. and they've had a lot of issues with that. So you've had people priced out of their homes, and then because of that, there's kind of a push on their social services. And then what's concerning is that when you have these incentives, so that means that the government is not taking in as much money, mm -hmm. um, then you have a big increase in social services and then infrastructure issues. And so it's like you have an increased cost, but not a, not a requisite increase in revenue that a large firm should bring in. Okay, I want, I, want to, I want to park there for a second when you talk about the government not bringing in as much money, um, because that seems like the obvious issue here. That seems like the obvious problem when you talk about uh, you know, Amazon's tax rate and right. or lack of tax rate, I guess, right? Like they, 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 they just, you look at Jeff Bezos, the richest man in the world. He's that's still right, right? Like, like the, it was just not that long ago that he surpassed Bill Gates as the richest man. It, he's way up there. Let's just put it that way. He's doing okay. He's doing just fine. And they, Amazon pays little to no taxes. How? How do I mean Arlington County and Queens, New York? I think of as fairly progressive cities, right? How do these progressive cities allow something like that to happen? Because what the and Seattle, by the way, and right. Seattle, I guess, would be a progressive right. city. Because then the argument is that while Amazon as a firm may not pay as much in taxes, mm -hmm. their employees do, or you look at sales tax. So people spend a lot. I mean, as you mentioned, and I'm an Amazon Prime subscriber too. So you know we we're spending money, yeah, and then we're paying taxes on that. And then you know the people who live there, they go to the coffee shops, they go to the supermarkets, they go to you know they're at the schools, they're at, and so it's like okay, Amazon might have to be paying their share, but then the people who work here are doing that. They're bringing stuff in. They're going to our restaurants, and so that's where the kind of the argument is that we're bringing these people in as opposed to having no firms and then being a ghost town. You know, I I feel better having heard you say that you're an Amazon Prime subscriber because it is conflicting, right? Ray, you, we talked about this before. You're also an Amazon Prime subscriber. I am an Amazon Prime subscriber, user. My brother works at Amazon. Um, he worked in Seattle. He now works in the Herndon office. I have a lot of conflicting feelings about this and the fact that they're coming here to Arlington, where my family has lived for 70 years. And there are things like these immigrant populations that are here that are close to the city and that have like economic mobility because of their proximity to the city. And I worry about the property taxes going up because those people are going to be pushed out and they're 100%. not going to be able to afford their property taxes every year. And if they're renters, they're not going to be able to afford their rent. You know, <sighs> The, the thing about this that really is just so frustrating is Amazon provides a great service. They provide a lot of jobs. They, uh, they show how you can take an idea and constantly innovate, 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 innovate to where you get a really, really good product. Like, I think Amazon does a great job. For that, they make a ton of money. For that, they should, and then and then, then then we start to part ways. <laughs> For that, when they make all this money, they should be paying their workers, paying taxes. Like this is, it, it seems like this is where we used to be as a country. Like yes, you should be allowed to get as big as an Amazon. That should be that should be something that businesses should strive for. Right. But when you get to that point, you got to take care of your people. You got to pay your you got to pay your workers. You got to provide health insurance. You've got to. There's a responsibility that comes with getting so big, right? But that only tells half the story. Because when you say you have to take care of your people, the question is, who are your people? And so we're thinking about this kind of economy, and Good you think point. about shareholders. Good point. And you think about, and so that brings me back to kind of the opportunity zones. Is that you know, in terms of that policy, the policy is centering investors. You know, their capital gains. <sighs> you know, getting the money out. And but if you center the actual community and the local residents then that program would be structured different. And so everything we have to look at when we kind of analyze this, is like, okay, well, who is being centered? Who is the focus? So you say Amazon should take care of their people. Well, you need to find who are their people. That, you know, gosh, that's such a good point. That's such a good point. And so when you define people, then, you know, behavior makes 
you know, a certain sense. Yeah, they are taking care of their people. Right. It's just a matter of who their people really are. That's a, that's a very, very good point. So, uh, you know, uh, I, I mentioned earlier we have the uh, the weekend podcast that we put up. And, and this past weekend I interviewed Gideon Resnick from the Daily Beast. And he talked about uh, there is some new legislation that Bernie Sanders introduced with Ro Khanna to take on Walmart. Right. Because Walmart's not paying their workers either very well. And Bernie Sanders did something similar a couple months ago when he proposed this legislation against Amazon. And Amazon has uh, workers who literally sleep in their cars. Hmm. They have no health care. They have a very, very, very hard time. They were getting paid terrible wages. They just reversed that. They they upped their wages. They changed their minimum wage for all Amazon employees. They did get around it a little bit, right, with like some stock options and things like that that they're not going to be offering anymore. But I guess what I'm trying to get at here is what is it that's going to change the culture here? Um, you know, I know that there are some people who are screaming at the radio or the TV right now, like you just have to get rid of capitalism. I don't disagree, but let's talk about incremental steps right, for now. Right. Uh, what is it that is going to make Amazon sort of, or I should say, who is it that's going to make Amazon actually do their duty, do their take, like do this in a responsible way? I guess is what I'm trying to say. That is a very difficult question to answer because when it comes down to it, I would have to say public pressure. And but the question is, what does that mean? And how are you talking about public pressure? Because yeah. as we mentioned, all three of us are Amazon Prime subscribers. So the, is there an incentive for Amazon to change their behavior? You know, is there an incentive for them to, you know, provide services, pay more wages and uh, benefits, and then they're going to have higher prices? And if they have higher prices, are people going to continue to spend at Amazon? Yeah. And so things like the. Uh, Bernie Sanders bill earlier this year, the raise the wage act currently, that kind of stuff can kind of put public pressure to kind of get moment. You almost want to need to get momentum going. Yeah. 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 To yeah get people yeah. talking about it and say, and then, you know, you think about when there's a, a show and then they have someone who is disagreeable mm -hmm. and then there's that people put pressure on the advertisers, the advertisers to pull out. Yeah. And so it's kind of thing where you have to find ways of putting public pressure to saying that as a society, we believe that people should have higher wages. People should have benefits. And then our actions, our behaviors are going to try to shift that towards, you know, getting that. So, you know, boycotting certain firms, you know, shifting to other types of yeah. firms and that kind of thing. And then, you know, what Congress is doing with some of those bills is like try to get that momentum going that, you know, 10 years ago. You know, no one was talking about raising the minimum wage. The, the, the problem with going to another service is there is no, no other service. service that does what Amazon right. does. So uh, we're on Twitter at BP Show, at BP Show. I just want to read a couple of quick comments. Uh, Romaine says, I'm an Amazon Prime subscriber, and I also feel the conflict. I even rent my school books for college and have done all of my gift shopping with Prime. Christmas is coming up. It, it's been a Prime Christmas for the last couple of years for me in my house. Also, um, Ron says shareholders are owners who need to take care of their employees. And we have about a minute left, but I'm going to throw a question at you that maybe you can answer in a minute. Uh, Bab says, ask your guest if revenue coming back ever offsets the incentives given away. No one study suggests that cities win. Do you know of one? No. Okay. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there you the go. The short answer is no. <laughs> Asked and answered. So really this is not, I mean, we, there's a history of this not working out in that way. Right, but the problem with looking at it straight just in terms of numbers is that you have firms, so for example, I think it was like Fairfield, Connecticut used to be the headquarters of GE. Sure. And then GE moved to Boston. Okay. Now, as a politician, you're that politician who lost GE. Sure. You know, you think about these firms that leave and move away, and then you're that politician. So as a politician <laughs> who has the incentive to stay in government, you have to try to do everything you can to keep it. And so you can make, so when Foxconn came to Wisconsin, there was a lot of hoopla about it because, like, hey, we have this firm coming in and they're going to bring the jobs. Whether they actually bring the jobs or whether, you know, it was worth it, to be able to have that ribbon cutting kind of uh, image, that's what, that's why we keep seeing that's this. That's what they want.
That's what they want. Man, that's... It's pretty bleak story. I have to say, Amazon, for as great of a service as it is, it, it's got so, so many core problems. Benga Adjilore, Senior Economist at the Center for American Progress. Thank you so much for bringing your big brain in here and helping me get through this. Thank you for uh, having me. Have a great holiday. We'll, uh, we'll be right back, y'all. This is The Bill Press Show. Sorry. Just in case that was her answer. No, I'm sorry. Well, I'm sorry. What? What, what is? The, what, is Halloween your favorite? I, I, is Halloween your favorite? <laughs> no. Like it's I want to call the po- everything. I'm lucky enough to be heading to. To Cancun. Oh, look at you. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, I'm hitting the road today to go visit my family in uh, South Carolina. Don't hold it against me. I'm from North Carolina, so I Are you really? am going to hold it against you, but not for the reasons you think. Fair enough. Fair enough. We're not going to get into a conversation about North Carolina versus South Carolina barbecue, uh, <laughs> which which could very well turn very ugly. Uh, but we'll just keep it friendly for now. So if you are traveling uh, for Thanksgiving, 54.3 million Americans will travel 50 miles or more from their homes for Thanksgiving holiday. That's, that's how many people are going to be out there traveling. I mentioned the AAA also put out the worst days for travel and the worst time for travel. Los Angeles, the worst time is Wednesday between 2.30 and 4.30 p.m., which I think is, like, so Los Angeles. It's, like, last minute, you know, like, eh, fine, we'll get on the road. Like, you know, it's just pretty loosey-goosey out there. San Francisco, the same thing. Wednesday between 1 and 3 p.m. New York. Tuesday, today, between 6 and 8 p.m. And Washington, D.C., today, between 5 p.m. and 7 p.m. Those are the busiest travel times. Well, I mean, I I really can't think of a good time to travel in Los Angeles. Aside from that. (laughs) Fair point. I'm I'm unsurprised. Uh, Absolutely fair point. I'm driving, which I don't normally do to South Carolina. But I got like I'm taking my kids, like I bring my dog this time, and it's just like a whole. And we're gonna be there for a couple days, so it's like I'm dreading this drive. Well, I'm very familiar with the uh, 95 to 85 route, so but it's terrible. Big question: Is the dog riding in the car or on top? <laughs> <laughs> very good question. Very good question. Well, so so if you've driven that way before, you know very well about the phenomena, the enigma that is south of the border. <laughs> yes. I grew up in North Carolina. How could I not know okay. about south of the border? Okay. I, I only have like 30 seconds before we have to take a break, but we all know this is just common knowledge, right? That south of the border is the front is a front for the mafia. You guys you know that, about right? The restaurant? No. No. <laughs> no. Well, there is a restaurant there. But, all right. I, 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 I'm I think go- we have to pick this up. I'm going to have to pick this conversation up on the other side of the break. So we're going to take a really, really, really quick break. Our affiliates have to join in. But uh, when we get back, I'm going to tell you about South of the Border. Y'all just hang on.
This is the Bill Press Show. It is the Bill Press Show. Thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Peter Ogburn, sitting in for Bill Press today. I appreciate you tuning in, whether you're watching us at youtube.com slash the Bill Press Show or on Free Speech TV or listening to us on one of our great progressive talk radio stations or listening to us on our podcast, which you absolutely should subscribe to. Uh, I mentioned it's Thanksgiving week. We're going to be out on Thursday and Friday, but we have... Recorded. We already done it. It's ready to go. Uh, some excellent content for you to consume on Thanksgiving Day and the day after. So when you are cooking the holiday meal or uh, just hanging out eating leftovers, we got you. We got you. We got whatever you need. We're gonna have shows up for you. So don't forget to subscribe so you get them. Okay. Joining me now uh, is Judicial Affairs Editor at Daily Kos. Her name is Rebecca Buckwalter Poza. Rebecca, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you again for having me. We were discussing, for the, by the way, I, the other thing about the podcast I should mention, if you're subscribed, you get a little extra content because we start the show a little earlier than what you can hear, like if you're listening to WCPT in Chicago uh, or in Asheville or in Indiana. If you are listening to us, you don't get the first five minutes of the show. And... There's some there's some great stuff that happens in there. So we were just talking in the in, in, beforehand about your travel. I'm from South Carolina. You're from North Carolina. And I said that if you've driven down 95, you have no doubt been to south of the border. Now, Ray, are you you are not familiar with south of the border? No, I'm not. I still think that you're talking about this like chain restaurant. No, 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 no. If you've ever driven south on 95. And, okay. and you get to the South Carolina, North Carolina border, there is the tourist trap to end all tourist traps. Is that how you would describe it, Rebecca? Uh, yes, except more dangerous. It's very dangerous, vaguely racist. Not vaguely. Not vaguely. Yeah. It's ra- it's full on racist. <laughs> I don't think I'll be visiting there anytime soon. No, 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 either. no. I, I, I mean, I, I, I don't want to, to glamorize it at all, but it is a sight to behold. I mean, it is something that if you are ever traveling down there and you've never been, you should go see it. Even if you just drive through, it's a mini town that has popped up at the North Carolina South. You should throw a googlay on this just to look. Okay. A North Carolina South Carolina border. Uh, as you get about 180 miles away from the border, you start seeing billboards for it. And as you drive south or or north, you see all these billboards south of the border, south of the border. And they have this, again, racist mascot, Pedro. <laughs> yep. And as you get closer, it is a Mexican-themed rest stop that has... A fireworks store, a gift shop, a restaurant, a gas station, a tchotchke shop. Only one of those, though, is really important, and that's the fireworks depot. Yeah, the fireworks depot slaps. Yeah, I will say it caused uh, no small amount of tension in my household that my um, Iowan father loved going for the fireworks, and my Colombian mother was... <laughs> A little on the fence yeah, yeah, as to, uh, you know, this this institution. But really, it's it's all about the fireworks. And in North Carolina, you drive to south of the border to get the good fireworks. Yeah. No, th- these are, South Carolina has the will blow your friggin' hand off fireworks. Yep. Like, they have fireworks that will do some damage. <laughs> I don't know if I should be terrified or impressed. Both. Both, I think, would be good. I think it would be good. But if anybody has ever, if anybody knows south of the border, and I mentioned this, it, it's an established fact in my mind that it is a front for the mafia, because Trump. No, seriously, you like it's a small city that's cropped up, and it's like on ninety five. It's not quite, you know. It's not. It's it's like halfway between like which mafia, like the Irish mafia, the Italian mafia. Like, I, I, look, don't ask me about just that. A mafia. I'm just throwing it out. Okay, there. okay, okay. I'm just like, like you have all these people running drugs and guns and all this stuff from Florida up north. Like, I absolutely believe that the south of the border is a front for the mafia. You know, I think it's not that sophisticated. Um, I, to be honest, I think it's more of a, a meth related. Yeah, it's it's awfully meth. Racket. Yeah, I think somebody should do some reporting on this. Somebody, You're, I am intrigued. This is your next story. Pitch it, Peter. Somebody, so, you know what? I would absolutely love to write a, a piece about this because it's all like in my mind as a young child when we would drive because we would drive north from South Carolina. 
it was this magical place. <laughs> for a kid, for sure. For a kid, it's a magical place. Yeah. And, you know, when I had kids, I was like, and my parents would never stop, right? And they were like, no, we're not going to stop at South of the Board. We're not going to stop at South of the Board. It's, it's, it's a mess. I was, I'd be so bad as a kid. And I was when I got kids... And we drove north for the first time. I was like, I am not going to do what my parents did. We're going to stop, and we're going to see south of the border. <laughs> and you know what? We stopped, and I was like, yeah, I, I, now I completely understand why my parents <laughs> never stopped. It is a hellhole. <laughs> it is a hellhole. For us, my father drove south explicitly for the purpose of going to south of the border. <laughs> <laughs> so it says something about our respective childhoods. Yeah. But you're also, you're missing, is it? Carowinds. Carowinds. Yeah. Yeah, so, Carowinds. So that was that was the North Carolina tour. You went to South Carolina for South of the Border and Carowinds. Yeah. Carowinds was like Six Flags. Yeah, for except us. I think also a little more dangerous. Awful, yeah, 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 yeah. There was definitely The roller coasters had a couple bolts loose yeah. and or missing. <laughs> My uh, my harness flew up at the top of a curve. Awesome. Once notable. totally supposed to happen. Yeah, yeah. you yeah. know, and and when you're nine or ten, you don't quite get that moment. Could have made you a Daily Mail headline. Oh, <laughs> oh God. Anyway, uh, I guess my way of saying this is my way of saying: please be safe if you're traveling on Thanksgiving, and if you are going up or down the ninety five I ninety five corridor, and you have never been to south of the border, it's worth a stop. In daylight hours. <laughs> Don't go after dark. No longer than 15 to 20 minutes. No longer than 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, don't eat the food there. Buy some fireworks. Buy some good uh, blow your fingers off fireworks. And and, and 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 check out south of the border. Okay, so I did not bring you in to talk about uh, Southern Americana kitsch. I brought you in to talk about, you know, constitutional crisis. Uh, crises yeah. uh, and, and all this stuff. So I, I want to jump in, first of all, to uh, Jim Acosta, who now has his White House hard uh, pass reinstated. Uh, the White House also sort of dangled over him that, like, no, we could do this again. We could absolutely do this again. But it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, part of the reason that the judge sided with Jim Acosta on Friday was because the White House did not really have a set uh, it, a series of rules for taking this away. Yeah, I mean, you you could definitely boil it down to that. Um, I mean, there are a couple of other notes I'd add. One is just that there's there's this decision from, from 1977 that essentially, I mean, <laughs> forecloses anything on the White House's part. Um, and, and coming up with rules is, is one step toward it because the problem is there's no – once you've given a reporter a hard pass and there's a First Amendment right, et cetera, et cetera, um, you have to go through due process to take that away. And that's a lot harder if you don't have rules about you know what that pass is contingent on. But I don't even think giving rules, which they've now done as of um, – as of yesterday, in fact, uh, is is going to get them any farther along the road of uh, being irrational and legally protected in that <laughs> right. irrationalness. So. Right, right. I want I want to read their their the, just a summary of their of their new rules. Uh, <laughs> one question at a time. I mean, this th- these are honest. Honestly, imagine reading these to a a kindergarten class, and they make a lot more sense. Right. One question at a time. Follow-up questions are only allowed at the discretion of the president or White House staff. Right. Give up the mic immediately after asking your question. Failure to follow rules fa- failure to follow rules revol- results in revocation of hard pass. Like this is this is honestly it's like preschool. I mean, it's yeah, and and my initial take on this was they're either out of thin air or out of some hellish 1990s word processor gone awry. Um, but it, yeah, yielding the floor when applicable, in qu- you know, requires it's and and number four is failure to abide by one through three. Right, right, yeah, right, 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 right. Right. I mean, they're they're rules for kids, and this is just not how press briefings work. Right. Right. And so it's um it, it's funny because they've painted themselves into a corner, and I don't quite know how they even intend to abide by these going forward i th- i'm i'm hoping for mass revolt from the journalists i wouldn't hold your breath well the white house press uh, correspondence association is already 
taken as firm a stand as they're going to verbally, perhaps, but yeah. um, certainly indicative of skepticism. Yeah. Um, and, and even opposition. So, you know, these rules that they lay down, if they enforce them as strictly as I absolutely expect them to enforce them, uh, this could create a lot of problems. I mean, no follow up questions? Really? But. What are we getting out of follow-up questions right now? Okay, I, I, I will agree with you on that. Like, <laughs> I, I think that's a very valid point. I, I, I think that the press briefings, everybody sort of, uh, you know, wrings their hands and gets upset about, oh, there are no press briefings, another press briefing that's not going to happen. It's like, who cares? Right. What are we really getting out of these right. press briefings? Like, you know, they start airing, they've started airing these press briefings every time that, that, that she does one, and they did it when Spicer did them as well. I didn't learn anything from those. No. Did no. you? No, and I think it's, a, you know, if it's if anything, we're playing into their outright, uh, outrage cycle of just coming up with a different sort of absurd. How many times can we have a headline about Sarah Huckabee Sanders saying something that's not true? Right. I mean, that's just, if, an, if what comes of this is that the White House press corps spends its time outside of the White House or investing uh, more effort in developing ties with people who are going to say something true uh, about what's going on in the White House, then that's that's a net bonus. Yeah. Now, you have a little bit of uh, experience <laughs> in this. <laughs> you sued the President of the United States. I did. How did t t you just got to tell me the story. Um, well, I'll start off by saying I, I highly recommend it. <laughs> Um, okay. So I, I just, you know, I, I tweet, not as prolifically as some people, but I tweet. And for a while there, I had uh, Trump on on an alert, and uh, he tweeted something to the effect of, you know, blah blah blah, mass media. If they'd had anything to do with it, there'd be zero chance I'd have won the White House. Uh -huh. uh, and I just replied and I said, well, to be fair, you didn't win the White House. Russia won the White House. Uh, he did not take kindly to that. And I just noticed my watch stopped buzzing. <laughs> and so it took me about three days to realize it wasn't that. So uh, let, me, let me ask you, this. was that the first time you'd ever tweeted at him in, no. in a negative way? All right, okay, okay. No, I mean, you know, but I, I try to maintain a policy of civility on Twitter, relative civility on Twitter. Um, so, I, you know, I tweeted him if there was something um, substantive to sort of take a whack at. Sure. Um, and, and so the Knight Institute, the First Amendment Institute at Columbia University, started looking for people who'd been blocked. And I got a call a few weeks later from a very nervous uh, 1L at Harvard Law School, and he's reviewing, it seems like, every tweet I've ever sent out into the ether. Uh -huh. I'm just thinking, this poor guy. <laughs> um, God, I don't ever want to go through that. Right. I never, ever, ever want to well, have that I mean, experience. Just, I would just die. Thousands of tweets. He knows a lot more about lesbians now. <laughs> Um, so and, everybody learned a little something. Right, right. <laughs> and, and and then he goes, so um, it appears that you don't use profanity on Twitter except for this one tweet. And I was like, is it the one about the beef export policy? <laughs> yes, yes, you said bullshit. I was like, yes, that's right. Well, that, yeah, like, yeah okay. Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, you know, if you're talking beef export policy, right. that's definitely worthy. Right. And it. so I'm like, okay, so, you know, so you have a, a, a semi decent plaintiff for this case. I've not called him names, I've not, you know, sworn at him. And so I find myself in a group of seven remarkable humans who have each pissed off Donald Trump in their own way. Yeah. And we sued under the First Amendment saying once you've created a public forum, you have opened up your you know, Twitter account to engage with us, for us to engage with each other around what you're saying, et cetera, et cetera. You can't then block us on the basis of viewpoint. Yeah. And if this sounds familiar vis-a-vis <laughs> -vis a White House press briefing room, yeah. it's because it is. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> once you create a public forum, you can't just knock people out based on their views. Um, one thing I found interesting was that the Trump camp didn't try to argue that we were a bunch of trolls uh, <laughs> because they didn't want discovery. 
they didn't want to have to produce any documents. Uh, so we won that round, and that's on appeal now. Um, and CNN's dropped its suit for the time being, but you know, I suppose there's potential for those two two suits to be going on in tandem and developing that I, area I was going to say, I, I sort of see yeah. them sort of dovetailing here yeah. uh, together. That's fascinating. I mean, it, it, it it's kind of crazy that we have to go through this process to sue the president uh, for this type of stuff. But that's just, that's just kind of who he is. That's just where we are. Right? It's, I mean, everything about what's happening with the judiciary right now is surreal. That's one piece that I'm working on is, is just about how political judges have gotten. And by judges, I mean conservative judges. Yep. And it's not happening. Wait, you don't mean the activist judges that Ted Cruz yells about all the time? <laughs> not those judges? I mean, we, we can get to that Ruth Bader woman later. <laughs> right, um, right, right. I love you, RBG. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, these are and these are always panels with at least one Trump appointee on them. There's one that, that came out the opposite way on a case that just went to the Supreme Court on abortion rights. Yep. There's another one. That says that the right to harass gays is a First Amendment right, more or less. I mean, it's it's really terrifying how overtly political they're getting. Yeah, I'd say it's terrifying. I'd say that's a good way to put it. It's terrifying. Um, but this is – oh, by the way, I just have to mention, shout out to Michael, uh, who follows us on Twitter, who just sent me a, like, black and white photo of – Pedro's Coffee Casa <laughs> from south of the border. I, I would like to see. That is my request. It's pretty great. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Pedro's Coffee Casa. You know, I, it's like a black and white photo. Was, I, was that always there? That looks classier than the last time. Well, I, you know, I actually I don't want to go off on too much of a tangent okay, on South of the Border. Right, we've talked but enough. I, but no, no, no. I, I, I will say I did watch yeah. an interview with like a, the, the guy who runs it now who's the son of the guy who started it. And it, it did start out, again, at the time, uh, it was not considered racist, but it's 100% racist now. <laughs> uh, not that that's an excuse. I'm not trying to excuse right, it. Right. I'm just saying, like, you could get away with that back then. You, I don't think you could get away with, like, putting up a south of the border now. Okay, right. So it, Maybe. You know, Maybe. So white supremacism, you know, rises and falls with the times. Sure, sure. Yes, um, right. Something like that. But my point is... Uh, it, it used to be like a nice-ish establishment that was like a, still a tourist trap, but like, hey, we'll just this is where I you mean, can stop and refuel and get. All this I have stuff. no complaints about my time there. I I eyes wide open when it. Oh, comes I have to, plenty. Of, I have plenty of complaints I, about my I have time none, there. None, because I was I was a little kid, enthusiastically picking through fireworks with my father, looking for what would do the most damage. Yeah, oh yeah, that's what you so, gotta do. That's what I do with my kids. Right. When we go by there. Uh, okay, so anyway, thank thank you, Michael, for sending me that photo. I I, I appreciate <laughs> it. Um, so you, we talked to, earlier. We had this earlier about the White House reporters uh, boycotting these briefings and joining together. And what I, I don't see a whole lot of solidarity on that front. No, I mean I just have a lot of dreams, right? For this, sure. how how we fight back. One is that. Um, everyone stops going to briefings or just sends interns. I mean, send interns to the briefings. That'll make a statement. And then if they fight over the microphone, it'll be a fair fight. Um, but other than that, I mean, it's just absurd. Um, <laughs> and, and, and this is not the only legal tussle. This is part of what makes me think it's story of the week. Because at the same time, you've got the lawsuit about Matt Whitaker, who's supposed to be our new attorney general. You've got... Uh, oh, yeah, that. You know, you've you've got Trump saying that basically asylum's over if you're not at a at a given port, and and asylum's been kind of screwed to start with under the Trump administration. So I just have to think that whatever the storyline that plays out, whether or not people object, things I hope are are going to go back more or less to the way that they were: infrequent press conferences, yeah, non answers. Um, and, and if, you know, follow-ups will creep back in. I think that's probably right. I think that's probably right. Okay, so you hit on um, Whitaker, the acting attorney general. Uh, so let's talk about that. We're going to talk more about that and the lawsuit that the Democrats, a couple of Democratic senators brought forward with uh, Claire Foran, a congressional reporter for CNN, who's going to be in the studio uh, in the next segment, so stay tuned for that. But let's let's dive into it a little bit because – 
we've seen multiple constitutional crises over Donald Trump's presidency, the two years of Donald Trump's presidency. Right. I think this could be the most dangerous one. Agree or disagree? Whitaker. Huh. Yeah. I, I think th- I think so. Yeah, I mean, just because of the repercussions for Mueller. That's the thing. Yeah, I mean, it's... and 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 also just it could just send ripples far out. You know, to just if you can do this, and he could get away with this, what can't he get away with? I you know I'd say that, but I'm I'm torn because this is kind of a more. This is a a self-contained, a relatively self-contained procedural legal fight, whereas one of my big fears, uh, and, and it started with the Muslim ban, was that there would be a Supreme Court order that Trump just wouldn't follow. Sure. And, and initially, that's what was happening. Um, you know, Customs and Border, I, they weren't following the court order. I think what's different now is that Trump has a Supreme Court. Yeah. Um, so I think any constitutional crisis is unfortunately much more likely to work out for him. This is not the hill that I would have picked to die on if I were a petty dictator with a penchant for shredding the Constitution, but <laughs> it it may still work out in his favor. Do these Democrats that are uh, suing over that, I mean, the, the, the real issue here is that we now have an attack, an acting attorney general who was not confirmed or vetted by con- uh, by Congress or the Senate, do they have a shot here? Do they have a case? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think it, I think it could be um, tricky to figure out at what juncture you have the strongest case, but um, Hirono and Blumenthal and White House are, are absolutely right that um, they, you know, they've been deprived of the duty to advise and consent yet again. This yeah. is this is not the the first time. Right, such a, right. You know, They're used to this. It's. I mean, let's let's not talk about Merrick Garland, but well, let's please not talk about Merrick Garland. Definitely don't say that name one more time. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I I I am hopeful. I think that if not this suit, then one soon. Um, and, and I think that there are a lot of career people within DOJ who are not happy to be there and see things like this going on. Yeah. Um, so this isn't a case of, of his picking um, safe turf necessarily. Right. You know, the, the one thing that, that I, I think is one of the more horrifying thoughts in a land filled with horrifying thoughts is um, – Republicans realize that ideologically they've lost on a lot of issues, right? And so really the only thing that they can do is pack the courts, rely on the courts to bail them out. And this is, I think, one of the first real tests for that uh, because they have effectively packed the courts. And we're talking about – I mean, we're talking about generations – Oh, yeah. That will be affected by this, to pa- to to uphold and reverse and all that policies that benefit Republicans. Because if you put these uh, policies to a vote or put it to the American people, they don't support them. No, regardless no. of Donald Trump being elected president, no. I think that that you know he didn't win the popular vote. We've got a screwy system, and he also ran on this idea of being like out beyond, like above beyond right, politics. Right. right? Like I don't think that that really factored in with his election but you know like if you were to put mitch mcconnell and his ideas up for a vote on a nationwide scale he would lose easily yeah i mean in fact they they won or rather they lost at the national scale back in 2016 yeah they lost by uh more than double that margin on the national scale in the midterms yeah seven seven million votes versus the three million i mean yeah this is not the agenda that people care about or want. Um, and and what's incredibly concerning is thinking about how long it's going to take to roost, especially the policies that are being affected through the judiciary, such as wiping out regulation. Uh, you know, you ask the American public, hi, do you like safe drinking water? Yeah. How do you feel <laughs> about breathable air? Right. Um, and, you know, especially in the West Coast right now. Yeah, um, yeah which my prayers go out to, um, 
no one wants the end of regulation, but Republicans are, are doing away with it. They're making it easier for courts to strike regulation, harder for agencies to create regulation. You know, all these boring things that maybe even if you put them to a vote, people would just be like, this is so boring. You're right. What's next? Right. No. Um, and that's what's so dastardly and brilliant. Uh well, uh, Judicial Affairs Editor at Daily Kos, Rebecca Buckwalter. Posa, thank you so much for joining Your first trip to the show, hopefully it won't be the last. Uh, my fellow Carolinian, North Carolinian, I'm a South Carolinian, I appreciate <laughs> you, you, you coming in and, and talking us uh, through this. You can follow her on Twitter at RPBP. Make sure you are following her there. And stay tuned, everybody. The Bill Price Show will be right back with Claire Foran from CNN. On your radio, on TV, and online, this is The Bill Press Show. Hey, Hard, what's this? That's my resignation letter. You're resigning? Why? Because you're constantly ignoring me. You're half as active as you used to be, and you read stuff like this. You've been putting me under a lot of pressure lately. That's why I'm ready to quit. I, I forgot. I'll, I'll do better. Please, don't quit on me. Okay, but remember, it's not what you say. It's what you do. Listen to your heart. Don't let it quit on you. Let's go for a walk. Uncontrolled high blood pressure could lead to a stroke, heart attack, or death. Get yours to a healthy range before it's too late. Adventure can be found anywhere, but the best place to start is in the forest. I spy something beginning with S. Snow? No. Snow-covered trees? Nothing to do with snow. Head outside to discover incredible animals <laughs> and beautiful plants that come together to create an unforgettable adventure. Wow. So grab your loved ones. Don't even. And explore a world of possibilities. Come on, this way. Visit discovertheforest.org to find the closest forest or park to you. I grew up in the housing projects of Cleveland. I didn't even know that life could be any better than it was. Education for me has been a way to get away from the agony of what was normal life. I want to be able to impact the community, not just look back on where I came from, but to reach back to where I came from and pull some people up with me. My name is David, and I am your dividend. Hamilton was adopted from a rescue in 2008. She really likes to be around people. And as soon as I start to make my breakfast, Hamilton is right there. I get out my mat and I'm doing a downward dog and he's underneath. He's quite the pug about town. He gets invited to a lot of parties. He knows he's a pretty big deal. I mean, look at this little face. How could you not love him? Brought to you. Download our podcast, search for The Bill Press Show on iTunes, and remember to rate, review, and subscribe. This is The Bill Press Show. Hello, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to The Bill Press Show. My name is Peter Ogburn. I am not Bill Press. Bill is uh, 
Out of town for the Thanksgiving holiday, which I will be starting right after the show. I'm leaving town. Uh, but we still have one last segment here. And what a segment it is. Our old friend Claire Foran is here. Hi, Claire. Hi. It's good to be back. It's been so long since we had you on the show. Uh, you are now covering Congress for CNN. Yeah, I am. Uh, this came about, by the way, because I went to go get lunch the other day. Just pull back the curtain just a little bit. I was in line to get my lunch at Sweetgreen. And Claire walks by. And is I was this like, how this came about? This is how this came about. I'm so yeah. happy this came you're back, Claire. Because I, then I learned that you were covering the, the, the congressional beat, and we loved having you on before, and so it's so nice to have you back. I know. I'm so excited to be here. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> on this, the Thanksgiving week, which is America's finest holiday. I, uh, I also think it's, it's, yeah, I mean, what other holidays do you just get to focus on eating delicious food? My people, right here. <laughs> Finally, somebody agrees with me that Thanksgiving is the finest holiday. Also, Thanksgiving type decor, like the leaves, the garlands. It's yes. also beautiful in a way that I feel like no other decorations are. Fall is the greatest season. Agree. So in fall, the most notable holiday that we have is Thanksgiving. That all makes sense to me. By the way, I I cook Thanksgiving dinner almost by myself every year. I have for many, many, many years. I ta- I'm taking your questions and comments. The Thanksgiving hotline is open on Twitter at Peter Ogburn or at BP Show. Uh, KG asked me, how do you dress a turkey? I don't <laughs> stuff the bird. I don't stuff the turkey. It's not a good idea. It's not a horrible idea. It's just it's, it's you get inconsistent cooking times. It oh. takes so much longer. Plus, think about what you're doing. Like it's just gross. <laughs> it's a little gross. It's a little gross and a little unsanitary. Yeah. I mean, you're cooking the bird all the way through, so like, but still, come on, just cook cook your dressing separately. As far as I'm concerned, all right. That's what I say about Probably it. Probably streamlines the process. Completely. Yeah. It's so much easier. <laughs> it's more efficient. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, uh, we're talking all things Congress here uh, with Claire Foran. Now, remember the day after the election when Donald Trump had his clown shoes crazy press conference? And he talked. My favorite part of the press conference in a press in a, in a press conference that was filled with WTF moments uh, was when he started bashing the Republicans for losing because they did not accept his embrace. And we remember what he said about Mia Love. I saw Mia Love. She called me all the time to help her with a hostage situation. Being held hostage in Venezuela. Uh, but Mia Love gave me no love. And she lost. Too bad. Sorry about that, Mia. Sorry about that, Mia. <laughs> Sorry about that. Just going to call this race before it's called. The race still has not been called. In fact, as of yesterday, she was up, I think, 419 votes. Well, the, the tide has turned. Democratic Salt Lake County Mayor Ben McAdams, who's running against her, claimed victory yesterday. The race has not been called by most people, but he has claimed victory. Uh, ben McAdams, it appears as though he is ahead by 739 votes. Yeah. It's crazy. I mean, this race keeps, it, it's like such a roller coaster. And you're right, it was this really remarkable moment to see the president sort of like preemptively declaring that, you know, a member of his own party had lost when Sorry the race that, wasn't Mia. over. And then it's continued to. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it was, you know, it was one thing that he was just kind of going after, you know, even if the race was fully over, it's like unusual, of course, to rub salt in the wounds of your own party. But then it was the race hasn't hasn't still hasn't officially kind of concluded. And, no. and yeah, now it's looking like as of last night, um, Ben McAdams, a Democrat, is now taking uh, the lead. So it looks like he's going to be the guy, which I'm I'm sort of amazed that that's not a bigger story because. Mia Love was one of the considered to be one of the rising stars yeah. in the Republican Party, a young African American Republican uh, from Utah, uh, fairly high profile. Well, and if she gets knocked out too, I mean, it's just one less, you know, woman um, Republican member who's going to come back, and it's really striking because you know, so now we know. The really closely watched race where a Republican candidate, Young Kim, was running. I th- think that was in California. So she lost. So Carol Miller of, I believe, West Virginia, I think is going to be the only incoming 
woman uh, Republican who, like, as a freshman who won. Yeah. Which is really, you know, I mean, it's like reporters have kind of been commenting on this. It's like wow. pictures of just like the incoming freshman Republican class versus a Democrat class. It's such a striking contrast. Wow, that's but, amazing. Yeah. Yeah, meanwhile, on the Democrat side, I mean, it's it's being, I mean, we've had multiple years of the woman, right? Yeah. But like it, up to now, this is the most seismic shift in terms of getting women elected to Congress. Yeah, so huge contrast there. And then For if, the Democrats. Yeah. For just the Democrats, for the Democrats. Yeah. And then, um, and then, yeah. If Mia Love loses, that's just you know one wow, one fear, yeah. So uh, Ben McAdams, uh, assuming this race is called soon again, he claimed victory. No one, no one's really called the race yet. Uh, he could be coming to Congress, which makes things just a little more complicated in the race for the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. Um, where does he stand on this? Yeah, so Ben McAdams is one of 16 Democrats who signed a letter that went public yesterday saying basically that they would vote for new leadership in the speaker election. They didn't specifically say Pelosi's name, but it was, of course, you know, a warning shot to Pelosi and and basically a commitment not to vote for Pelosi. So yesterday, you know, we were trying to figure out it, it actually kind of looked like yesterday Ben McAdams might not win his race. And so that would be, you know, one one less kind of anti Pelosi vote, but now it's looking like he will. So that, of course, um, you know, potentially solidifies the numbers a little bit more in favor of the anti Pelosi camp. So you have 16, 16 people that signed that letter. um, And that includes Ben McAdams. And then you have a number of other sort of a handful of other Democrats who weren't on the letter, but are still saying they're going to vote against Pelosi. So Mm -hmm. that includes people like Connor Lamb and Abigail Spanberger. So they not on the letter, but sort of adding to that kind of anti Pelosi vote count. So I, I mentioned this yesterday. I guess you could call me a centrist in the sense that I 100% absolutely believe that Nancy Pelosi should be Speaker of the House. That being said, I have zero problem with incoming or progressive members of Congress saying that they're not going to vote for her and that there should, in theory, be a challenge to her. I'm fine with that. Yeah, I have no problem with that at all. But I think that at the end of the day, if like Nancy Pelosi is going to be Speaker of the House, and I and I'm f- fine with that too. I think that's the right thing. Uh, so, how much danger is she in? Well, it's interesting because it's it's well, it's hard to say right now because it's like one question is like how kind of hardened is this opposition? So it's yeah. like yeah, you have let's say you have like. 17 or 18 House Democrats that right now are saying they're not going to vote for her. So the question is, like, are they, like, never Nancy? Or, like, could you... (laughs) Never nancy yours. Yeah, or could they be swayed, you know? Because Pelosi's already started, like, last Friday in her office at the Capitol. She was meeting with all these incoming freshmen, you know. I don't know exactly what was going on in there, but she's, she's going to certainly take the time to try to figure out you know, if she can do anything, I think, that will move any of those votes. So that's kind of question number one is, like, do those numbers stay where they are? But then the second question is, you know, if so right now we still have a couple of House races on calls. We don't know exactly what the size of the majority will be. But but let's say the majority ends up being like 233 uh, House Democrats. Um, If that's the case, then Pelosi can only afford to lose like 15 um, votes if she needs to get to a uh, majority on the House floor of 218. Okay. And at this point, she wouldn't have the votes. So in some ways, that looks really bad for her. However, there are there are caveats. Okay, and, yeah, because uh, yeah. most of the reporting that I've read is uh, apocalyptic. They think that this is, well, like, that it so could actually it's, happen it's that really she won't get it. It's tricky because on the one hand, like, it is correct to say, like, Oh, if she has like if you're looking at the numbers right now and let's say she has, you know, more than 15 who are saying they're going to vote against her, like it would be accurate to kind of look at that and say, like, it's not clear that she has the votes or like it's looking like she doesn't have the votes. But the big, big, big asterisk to that is that one, a lot could change between now and then. So we really don't know. And but the other thing, and this is kind of a tricky, like procedural thing, is that she doesn't necessarily have to get two eighteen votes. There's ways right. she could get right. fewer than that. And and that's by, for example, if somebody goes on the floor and they say present yeah. and they don't say a name, that would lower the majority threshold. And that could be a potential way out because you could have like somebody who pledged to vote against her. They could say, well, she became our nominee. I didn't have another option. Right. So I right. voted present. So there's sort of different ways that the math could 
ultimately end up working out for her. I, I mentioned the apocalyptic stuff. I just wanted to read this headline that I got in my email from Politico. Pelosi's bid for speaker imperiled as public opposition grows. Imperiled? I mean, I feel like that might be a little strong for what we're up against. So he, here's the other question. If not Nancy Pelosi, yeah, that's then who? That's exactly what I was going to say next, and I think that's an important thing to keep in mind with all of this is that like there's no challenger right now. There is right. no official challenger. So we have, um, you know, Representative uh, Marsha Fudge talking about considering it, but I mean she hasn't formally entered the race, so there is no alternative. And that's the other thing. If there continues to be no alternative, I think you know, at the end of the day, that's also something that people could look at and they could just say, like, well, there no no alternative emerged. So even though I would have liked new leadership, there wasn't a chance to vote for new leadership and vote for Pelosi. This is, I think, an interesting moment for Democrats, right? Like, I like Marsha Fudge. I think Marsha Fudge is great. I think she's done some good stuff. Am I comfortable with her leading the Democratic Party in the House? I am not. I am not. Yeah. Am I comfortable having Nancy Pelosi lead the Democrats in the House? More yes than no. It's a resounding yes from me. That's fine. Yeah. I, that, that's fine. I I, I, I I am a little put off by the idea that she wants to work with Donald Trump, right? Like she's openly said she wants to work with Donald Trump. She was there at the inauguration day, like in the Oval Office, laughing and having fun with Donald Trump as if this wasn't some huge constitutional crisis that we have going on. Uh, but in terms of the Democrats, yes, Nancy Pelosi is the person I'm most comfortable having it. I, I guess I'm just wary with how Democrats are going to handle Trump in general. Yeah, and I think I think that's a lot. That's a big concern among you know, Democrats who do want to see Pelosi get elected is sort of that question of, well, who else would it be? Right. And and I mean, it's a complicated question because you could argue that part of the reason why there is no clear successor is because Democratic leadership has been so like static. You know, yes. they don't have a lot. They haven't had, you know, they haven't done a great job of creating a pipeline of really like letting people rise through the ranks. So it's sort of this double edged sword because you could argue, well, like, you know, maybe in some reasons you know, some reason there isn't a clear alternative is partially because of the way they've kept it so rigidly, yeah. like, locked in place. But but it's true. There really isn't. So so, so let me ask you this. Let, let's just assume, and this is assuming a lot, I realize, but let's just assume Nancy Pelosi becomes Speaker of the House, okay? We'll put that there. That's We'll, that's, we'll put that <laughs> yeah. on the shelf. We'll call that done deal. So then... You know, you've got Steny Hoyer, Jim Clyburn, who have sort of been very visible uh, in terms of leadership for many, many years. Then what happens? Well, I mean, it looks like they'll both, you know, come back in the number two and number three spots. And actually, did you see yesterday, um, you know, Clyburn was the only of the top three that was facing a challenge from Diana DeGette. Oh, she, yeah, yeah, She yeah. dropped out yesterday. <sighs> and And she sort of said in her statement, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but it was something like, some of her supporters had felt pressure to support like the top three as as it exists. So I feel like that kind of read to me as, you know, sort of a nod to that. Like, it's been this way. Yeah. People want it to be this way. There's pressure to keep it that way. But like, what's the harm in like, look, I like Sidney Hoyer a lot. I like Jim Clyburn a lot. Yeah. They both been on the show. They're wonderful. We love them and all of that. But like, what is the harm in them just stepping aside and saying like, OK, we'll put Sherry Bustos. In yeah. one of these roles, or Pramila Jayapal, or you know, someone who's younger with some real progressive uh, 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 credentials. What what's the harm in that? Yeah, I mean, I I it certainly feels like if they're not willing to do that, that they need to give some serious thought to figuring out, like, well, if you're not gonna if you're not going to do that and you're going to like rigidly stay in those two spots, like then there's got to be other things that you can do to help yeah. develop because it really doesn't feel like there's a lot being done right now. Yeah. I mean, you know, time will tell uh, with this stuff, you know, what happens. I, I feel very confident that Nancy Pelosi will be the speaker of the house. Now, uh, this is a question I ask everybody. Whenever we talk Nancy Pelosi, uh, I think it's only fair that we ask, about Chuck Schumer leading the yeah. Senate Democrats because uh, I, I agree and understand that Nancy Pelosi is not the perfect choice. I think she's the best choice, but she is not perfect. I think Chuck Schumer has been a disaster 
for the Senate Democrats. So why aren't we having this conversation? Why aren't we, uh, I mean, you know why, but like, <laughs> Why aren't we having this conversation? Why is yeah. there not such a big outcry for Chuck Schumer to be thrown out as leader? Yeah, I mean, it is interesting, especially when you think about, like, you know, Pelosi's coming in with a victory under her belt. Yeah, she Chuck did, Schumer, as I said, she yeah, did her job. Yeah, whereas Chuck Schumer, they're still in the minority. They they lost, you know. Admittedly, that was of, a very uphill battle. It but was, I, it was. But I don't care. I, I put Put the electoral stuff aside. It was, and I'm not making the argument yeah. as specifically like you sure. know pointing to the to them as people to blame, but but frequently those things are determining factors. You know, yeah. certainly if Pelosi had not, you know, if the if Democrats had not won with such a wide margin at this point, yeah. the calls for her to you know to the numbers of people that were kind of calling for new leadership would probably be larger, and and if they hadn't won, then you know I think absolutely there would be a like a really strong push for her to step down, whereas on um, agreed. So yes, so you're right. There, agreed. there were certainly underlying dynamics, and the House was, you know, sort of favored to to flip, and the Senate wasn't. But, but, but that's one thing that I think is interesting that it's even even in the wake of losing, you know, a couple of really important Democratic seats, there wasn't really any calls um, for new leadership in the Senate. And then, you know, the Senate Democrat election was like the least interesting election yeah. of all of them in the sense that like yeah. there wasn't any change like it was just like a so, so they voted by acclamation which i think is like i don't think they even did like a a count like it was just <laughs> like you know everybody kind of agreed that they would keep those those yeah. leaders in place so it is it's a really interesting contrast i mean i do think schumer has gotten a little bit more scrutiny uh, it's not on par with pelosi at all but you know there was recently you know, his office has had to kind of respond after that big New York Times piece that looked at Facebook and he, you know, got some bad, uh, I think, press related to that. And then did you see um, incoming Senator uh, Kirsten Sinema? She she commented like she was asked if she would vote, if she would have voted for him. And she just sort of said, like, I forget exactly what she said, but basically kind of was pointing out like it wasn't there wasn't really anything like there wasn't really any kind of competition there or anything going on, but sort of. But I do think those comments kind of did draw a little bit of attention to the to that contrast. Um, yeah, like I can I can say here are the reasons why I think Nancy Pelosi should be speaker. I can't name a reason why I think Chuck Schumer should be leader. I just can't. As a as a Democrat, as a, we we're we're a partisan show. You're you're a reporter for CNN, so you're you're not. But I'm just talking about me personally. Like I can't name what it is that Chuck Schumer has done for the Democratic Party uh, as as leader. I just can't. So whereas Pelosi can point to like concrete victories like the ACA and yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'll say it for the thousandth time. It should not be called Obamacare. It should be called Pelosi, Pelosi care. care. Yeah, doesn't quite have the ring to it. I guess maybe it's a branding issue. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean Schumer, maybe that's it. I mean I guess also Schumer hasn't hasn't been leading the Democrats on the Senate side as long as, as Pelosi. So he hasn't had as much time as sort of a counterpoint. But, you know, like he just came in post Harry Reid, yeah. which wasn't that long ago. Um, Pelosi's <sighs> been the leader for a lot longer. But to but, me, the nail uh, uh, in the coffin for just making up my mind about Chuck Schumer was when he just made a deal with Mitch McConnell to confirm all these judges so that these Democratic Senate candidates could go home to campaign for what? How'd that turn out? Didn't turn out very well. And all these judges, they got lifetime appointments, and that's that's just how Chuck Schumer works. Okay. So while we're in the Senate, let's talk about um, uh, a very interesting lawsuit going on. Uh, Ray, I want to play the clip of uh, Richard Blumenthal. He's the senator from uh, one of the senators from Connecticut who discusses this constitutional crisis that we might have on our hands with the acting attorney general, Matt Whitaker. Here's Richard Blumenthal. This dictatorial and autocratic action to appoint, in effect, a constitutional nobody, a lackey and sycophant, is not only bad policy, it is unacceptable as a violation of the Constitution. So he is one of the senators who is suing... uh, along with Sheldon Whitehouse and Maisie Hirono, mm-hmm. uh, about 
advise and consent, right? Like the Senate did not confirm this at now the acting attorney general. Uh, what's the timeline of this? How are we going to see this play out? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So this was a complaint that was filed yesterday. And yeah, as you said, the argument from these three senators is that uh, acting attorney general Matt Whitaker, who, of course, uh, you know, was elevated to that position after Jeff Sessions uh, was ousted as attorney general. So the argument is that it's an unconstitutional appointment because he didn't uh, undergo Senate confirmation in his prior position, which he was serving as chief of staff to um, to Sessions. And so, um, you know, the Justice Department, prior to this lawsuit even being filed, it's sort of issued its own kind of defense of, of yeah. Whitaker and their line is sort of that you know this he's an act he's serving in an acting capacity and that there's sort of a certain amount of time that it's you know legal for him to kind of serve in that capacity even if he hasn't been senate confirmed but but now we'll get to see i guess what you know what the court decides and you know i don't i'm not sure exactly like how quickly we'll see it play out but i would expect you know there might be some kind of initial um, ruling or finding, you know, maybe relatively soon, and and then we'll kind of see with cases like this, it could always get end up getting, you know, sort of pushed into other courts or sort of go higher up the chain. Um, I don't know what will happen with this one, but we'll have to see. Somebody just tweeted at me. Uh, <clears throat> Mom updated on Twitter says in all caps: Sherry Bustos is running for D Triple C chair. Pay attention. Caps intentional. You spew uninformed crap all the time. I know that. I didn't say that she wasn't. I was just saying, why not have someone like a Sherry Bustos run yeah. for that office? I, I I understand. Everybody relax. And I thought I thought you mentioned her name because she is interested in. She's clearly interested. She's interested in, in, in leadership. I mean, she she said, yeah. she said on our she show, wants to yeah, run for a leadership she, role. Yeah, yeah, she wants to run for leadership. So just just just, just relax. <laughs> just relax. It's very good. You're serving as like your own public editor in the moment. Look, sure, she's not wrong. I do spew uninformed crap all the time. That's what I do. But I wasn't uninformed when <laughs> Sarah, I said I'm not that. Sure if you were here for the previous half hour, but we talked about how this little town thing is like a cover for the mafia. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Hang on I wasn't. Hang on. I missed that. Hang on, hang on, hang on. <laughs> I have to say, have you ever driven down 95? And have you ever been to south of the border? Do you know about South of the Border? Well, it's, it's like a really famous chain restaurant. Okay, right? that's, what that's, that's, that's what Ray thought. That's what Ray thought. It's not the chain idea. restaurant. Okay. There is one of the biggest tourist traps in America is at the border of the North Carolina, South Carolina state line, and it's called South of the Border. Oh. And it is a kitschy, I said vaguely racist, but it's pretty racist, Um Pit stop. It's like a it's like a rest stop. Yeah. And they have a gas station, a, a restaurant, a hotel, a putt putt golf course, a fireworks store, <laughs> a souvenir shop. They have this, all this stuff, and it's just kitsch. It's terrible kitsch. Uh, but I'm I'm driving down 95 South today, and I will almost certainly tweet out a photo from South of the Border. If you're following me on Peter at, at Peter Ogburn. Something to look forward to. Something yeah. to look forward to, indeed. All right, Claire Foran, uh, she is with CNN. Uh, she covers Congress for CNN. You can follow her on Twitter at CK Marie. Have a wonderful holiday. Thank you so much you for too. coming in. Thanks for having me. We'll be back live tomorrow with guest host this Igor Volsky. Is the Bill Press Show.